good afternoon. I'm Herman Berliner. I'm the dean of the Frank G. Zarb School of Business at Hofstra University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. This is a terrific time in the history of Hofstra University Zarb School, and part of what makes it terrific is the person I have the honor to introduce in a few minutes. But in addition to having Dr. Roger Ferguson as a speaker, this year is also noteworthy because all that is happening at Zarb, including our new business school building, which will open before the end of the semester. And what a terrific building it is. Individual faculty offices, of course, academic club space, that's a first on our campus, lounge space, individual and group student study space, we have it all. Just inside the front door, there's a 5,000 square foot incubator. We have a new course for all of our first year students on entrepreneurship, taught in part in the incubator. We know that moving ahead, our economy will be fueled by technological breakthroughs. Entrepreneurs will be in the forefront and our incubator provides a laboratory where students can fully participate in what is happening. Behavioral research is a key to business success and we will have the most sophisticated behavioral research lab of any business school in the area. Facial recognition, eye tracking, pulse rates, varying temperature 25 degrees, lighting variations, we have them all. That is in addition to the 34 Bloomberg terminals in CV Star Hall, our classroom building which is attached by a glass bridge to our new building. A typical college or university may have two Bloomberg terminals, some have four, nobody else has 34. And stay tuned, beginning in January 2019, there will be a $3 million technology upgrade in the CV Star classrooms, thanks to a grant we've received, plus a $1 million upgrade of the common area, plus an Einstein's bagel shop, which just opened. I've listed all those things in priority order. Technology is getting another boost, thanks to our being the only university in New York State to have a partnership with IBM Global University. October 4th will be Hofstra IBM Day, and John Kelly, IBM Senior VP and Director of Research, including on the Watson Supercomputer Project, will be on campus. Global hands-on opportunities have also been increased. We are especially proud of our dual degree program with Dunbei University of Finance and Economics in Dalian, China, where our students earn both the Hofstra BBA and the Dunbei BS in Economics and spend the summer of their junior year having an internship in Dalian, China, all within the 128 credits that a student earns to normally just get the BBA degree. We also have a series of international experiences where our students are working with companies around the globe. One example is entrepreneurship in South Africa. At the beginning of the spring semester, students in an entrepreneurship course studied South Africa, studied South Africa startups. During spring break, they traveled to South Africa, uh, met with students from the University of Johannesburg, and then worked with startup businesses. They spent the rest of the semester working on their recommendations. This was followed by entrepreneurship in Israel with a focus on fintech and followed by the study of the ecosystem of Silicon Valley. And, and that is designed to see whether Sili Silicon Valley can be replicated on Long Island. This will be followed this year with entrepreneurship in Ireland, uh, where the class will be fortunate enough to be also be there on St. Patrick's Day. Entrepreneurship in South Korea and luxury marketing in Switzerland. On the graduate level, we have a new Master of Science degree in analytics, and we are about to launch a new Master of Science degree in accounting and analytics, and a Master of Science degree in market research and analytics. Decision-making is changing fundably, fundamentally through the use of analytics, and we're building it into more and more of our coursework. We are, over 70% of our undergraduate students pursue at least one internship, Full-time graduate students can pursue either internships or take part in our available co-op program. We are increasingly high-tech, increasingly high-touch and experiential, and we are increasingly global. And our students are the clear beneficiary as it should be. In addition, listening to today's speaker is of great benefit to our students and to all of us. Roger W. Ferguson, Jr is president and CEO of TIA, which is a Fortune 100 financial services organization 
and the leading provider of retirement service, services in the academic, research, medical, and cultural fields. I still remember when I was being interviewed at Hofstra University for an assistant professor of economics position, and it was the chair of the department that was trying to convince me to come to Hofstra. He said, and I have to tell you, and I was in, I think I was 25, I have to tell you, Hofstra has a terrific pension plan. We're fortunate that we're tied in with TIA CREF. Now, I must admit, at age 25, that didn't really resonate, but I certainly today appreciate and still participate in TIA and, and think it is the best of the pension services. Uh, Dr. Ferguson is also the former vice chair of the Federal Reserve. On 9-11, he led the Fed's initial response to the terrorist attacks and took the actions necessary to keep our financial system functioning, which in turn helped make sure that our, that our economy would not be compromised. Prior to joining TIA in 2008, Mr. Ferguson was head of financial services for Swiss Re, and prior to that, he was an associate and partner at McKinsey and Company. His list of community service is also impressive, including chairing the Conference Board, which is a global business membership and research association serving the public interest. He's also the co-chair of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Commission on the Future of Undergraduate Education, serves on the Smithsonian Board of Regents, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Board, and he also co-chaired the National Academy of Sciences Committee on the long-run macroeconomic effects of the aging U.S. population. As a macroeconomist, I can certainly relate to the aging U.S. population. Roger Ferguson received his BA, JD, and PhD degrees from Harvard University. It is an honor for me to introduce Roger W. Ferguson, Jr. Dean, thank you very, very much for that kind introduction and uh, for the invitation to speak here this afternoon. And I really am delighted to be here um, for a number of reasons. Um, first, I must say, before I go on that, I, I think I want to come on and, and, and use your new behavioral economics lab and get myself all hooked up. So on the first Friday in the month when the unemployment statistics come out, we can see how I react. I think it was, oh, so exciting. Well, anyway, I, I just commend you on that phenomenal list of great things that are going on at, at the Zarb School. I'm also really pleased to be here um, because I've, and my wife and, and I have both had a chance to interact um, with, with uh, Frank Zarb and the family and just anything to do to sort of honor all the great things that he and his family have done is important. And finally, though this may seem um, maybe on a different plane, as I was driving here, I discovered that two of my colleagues who were here we're both excited because they growth, said they grew up in the shadow of Hofstra University, and so there are lots of linkages uh, that, that, uh, that I want to identify. And I also want to identify one that uh, the dean talked about, which is the great link between my company, TIA, sometimes known, formerly known as TIA CREF, and Hofstra, because we have been their partner since 1945. Um, and, and exactly, and the dean started much later than that. Um, uh, but nevertheless, he's been the beneficiary of this uh, long-standing, uh, now you know, almost 80-some year relationship, and so we're really pleased to uh, be part of that partnership. Uh, all the faculty in the room would know a little bit about TIAA. For the students who uh, don't, you heard a, quite a bit from the dean already. Uh, the company was started 100 years ago by Andrew Carnegie, the great industrialist. Um, he happened to have been on the board of Cornell, um, and looked around and saw the faculty and staff there were really uh, living pretty close to poverty uh, as they got into retirement and thought that that should change. And so he and a number of colleagues about 100 years ago had the great vision that has now 100 years later become this Fortune 100 company. Uh, we now currently manage about a trillion dollars in assets. We serve five million people, including uh, the dean and others here on this campus, and 15,000 uh, institutions. And so that's sort of who we are and, and what we stand for. And I just thought I'd fill out a little bit of what uh, the dean had to say in his opening. Uh, as I turn to the topic at hand, I start by saying I know we have a very diverse audience here with all ages and life stages represented. Uh, and I hope that I'll be able to share some things that resonate with all of you, either because it sounds familiar because you've been through those life stages or maybe uh, perhaps it helps you think about the future that you're, uh, that's about to unfold before all of you. So I'm going to begin by talking about the rapid change that we see in today's world, which ties to the uh, topic, uh, and then I'm going to highlight some of the forces that are driving it, 
And then I'm going to share uh, three approaches um, that I believe are most important in order to uh, confidently prepare for success in the current rapidly changing environment. I want to uh, leave plenty of time for Q&A as well and to sort of mingle afterwards. So hopefully we'll move along in a way that uh, feels as though I'm touching the bases without lingering too long on any one of them. So let's begin by sharing just a few thoughts about the world of constant change in which we're living. Uh, the fact that things are changing uh, certainly is not remarkable. Uh, change is by definition a part of the nature and natural order of life. But what's different today is that, for at least those of us who are living through it, the pace of change seems to have accelerated tremendously. As one example that, that really tells me how quickly things have changed, it's absolutely remarkable to recognize that it's been literally only 11 years since Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone to the world. Um, you know, I and maybe even the dean were in college longer than 11 years, and so just think about how much the world has changed literally in one short decade. Uh, in the blink of the eye, uh, quite literally, the smartphone has changed how we communicate, how we work, and how we live. It's disrupted entire industries. It's shrunk the world. Uh, and today, most of us really can't imagine living without our devices and all the applications that are now on those devices. Uh, but imagine if someone had said to you 15 years ago that you really need a portable cell phone that also uh, is a camera and then can allow you to send uh, messages through the air. You know, you'd think, wow, creative, interesting, I'm not sure I really need it. And now no one, I think, can imagine a living without it. And as you well know, um, new iPhones are about to be introduced and I've been watching Warriors today and there's a lot of uh, ferment about that. So that's just one example of the pace of change and how the entire world has been disrupted and changed in a short period of time through one very important uh, innovation. Another one, and, and the Dean sort of uh, alluded to this a little bit, is artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, and that has given rise to powerful new forms of automation, along with other technologies such as self-driving cars, machines that read x-rays, uh, chatbots that can answer customers' questions. Uh, the partnership um, that the Dean referenced and the interaction with IBM and Watson um, brings all of that very much uh, to life for all of us in society and overall, and obviously for the students and the faculty here as well. Uh, and a third example uh, of rapid change is financial services. We've been in our industry somewhat slower to embrace some of these technologies, um, but you see outside of the industry the rise of disruptive innovations, uh, crowdfunding, uh, digital payments, robo-advising uh, that are shifting the landscape around us. Now, those of us who are in the industry obviously have the obligation to uh, learn from, uh, to adapt, to adopt, to purchase, uh, to compete with these new uh, technologies. So that's a third example of rapid change that's occurring around the perimeters, changing the way all of you uh, and many of us interact with financial services, and my industry now has to catch up with that. Uh, and that comes through uh, in my own life. I've got two millennial kids, and I've discovered that the concept of a check and how one fills one out, which my parents taught me when I was uh, in the fifth or sixth grade. My kids haven't learned how to do that, but they're great at sending me money uh, on Venmo, or more importantly, asking for me to send them money uh, on Venmo. And so this notion of financial technology, even as a CEO of a 100-year-old company with a trillion dollars, uh, is very much real and tangible to me, literally almost on a week-to-week -week basis as my kids ask me to send them money. Um, and the other point that's really important here with these three examples is since none of this could have been foreseen 10 or 15 years ago, it's quite safe to say that technology will rapidly transform our society in ways that we today cannot fully predict. Now, to be clear, many Americans are quite concerned about these developments, the rapidity of change and the inability to see where it's going to lead. And most importantly, it comes to uh, many folks by questioning what's going to happen in terms of fundamental things like job and job security. Um, I would say some of the writing in this area uh, strikes me as being a little bit of hysterical. There was an article I saw that predicted that in just 40 years, robots will have put most of us out of a job. Um, there was a line in that article that really hit home to me because it was addressed to CEOs and it said, quote, sorry, robots will run companies better than you do. So obviously, this article is clearly hysterical and wrong. Uh, it also mentioned deans and said, sorry. Well, I won't, I won't go there. 
Having said that, a more measured report uh, comes from uh, McKinsey and Company, where I used to be associated. It's a report from the McKinsey Global Institute, and they noticed something that strikes me as being much more realistic, uh, that about 5% of jobs have the potential to be fully automated, but importantly, 60% of jobs could at least be partially automated. And that represents even that number, which seems more grounded in the reality, significant disruptions. If you think about 5% of jobs uh, going away, but 60% being altered maybe in some fundamental way. Um, to be quite clear, uh, technology is not the only driver of change. It is in some sense the most visible and the one that we think of as being most disruptive. But I want to bring to your attention another one that is uh, inevitable, uh, somewhat visible, not necessarily thought to be disruptive, but actually will uh, transition the way the world works uh, shortly. And that's the demographic forces uh, that the dean, to some degree, alluded to early on in some of the work that I've been doing. So to put uh, uh, context around that, uh, the U.S. is aging relatively rapidly. Well, I, let me rephrase that. The U.S. is aging, it's actually aging slowly relative to some other countries. Um, but the result of that aging, um, or that aging is a result of two separate factors that I think are very important. Uh, the first is that lifespans are uh, expanding, they're increasing. Studies say that indeed half of the children born after 2000, so certainly half the children born this year, might live to be more than 100 years old. Um, and the second thing that's driving that is not just this increase in longevity, but for a lot of very good positive reasons, uh, uh, birth rates have also been falling. Um, and now the U.S. birth rate has dipped to a 30-year low. And it's predicted that in less than two decades, the world, the U.S. in particular, will end up uh, having more older people than children for the first time ever in our history. And that's the sort of the U.S. story. And as I said early on about talking about the relative aging, uh, if one thinks about Europe, one thinks about China, certainly Japan, many other major economies are aging even more rapidly uh, than we are. Um, dem these demographic forces are bringing some generational shifts. Uh, one uh, most obvious um, is that millennials, that generation between about 18 and 37, are about to surpass all of us aging baby boomers as the nation's largest living adult generation. And already, millennials are the largest generation in the U.S. workforce, in the U.S. labor force, which by definition has to change uh, the way that we're going to work. Uh, a third change is around the financial landscape. Uh, that's shifting as well. And what's going on there is all of us are facing increased complexity in our financial lives. Uh, a simple statistic that brings that to life is household debt is at an all-time high of more than $13 trillion. And famously or infamously, uh, that includes about $1.4 trillion of student loan debt. Uh, so just as we're dealing with those challenges in the world of financial change, we're also seeing that the household savings rate uh, is declining and is far below historical averages. Uh, in that third space of change, which is financial services, the other thing that's happened, I alluded to this earlier on, is not just the influence of technology, but broadly speaking, there's this much more choice uh, than there has been in a long time, and individuals have more control over their financial matters. Um, but that also means that there's been a shift of risk, as uh, uh, Professor uh, Jacob Hacker has written up at Yale. There's been a dramatic risk shift from individual, uh, to individuals from institutions uh, in the form of DC and DB plans, for example, where DB plans are less prevalent now and DC plans have become more so. But there are many other ways in which the world of finance has been one uh, that individuals are now taking on uh, much more risk. Things from taking out loans to pay for education, we've talked about uh, investment decisions for retirement, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, uh, in that space, sadly, similar to the other two, um, I would say that uh, we aren't necessarily fully prepared. Um, and so in the world of financial literacy, studies show that most Americans lack the financial knowledge that they need to make sound decisions uh, about uh, even simple, routine financial matters. And here I want to bring your attention to a new study that my company, the TI Institute, did that's literally just been released today. Um, and this was done in, in uh, conjunction with uh, the George Washington uh, University School of Business, and uh, an equally good, but certainly not better school than the Zarb School. 
Uh, and what we found when we gave them a number of questions is that millennials answered only 44% of the questions correctly. And these are simple, you would have answered all of them correctly. These are simple questions about compound interest, uh, insurance, uh, diversification of investments, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so while millennials were answering about 44% of these questions correctly, the rest of the adult population was somewhat better at 50%. Um, but neither number, by definition, 44% correct, 50% correct, uh, is not something that's very, very comforting when it comes to thinking about financial literacy and the obligations we all have to take care of our own finances that has been growing over time. Uh, the other thing that we discovered in this, in this survey, which was focused on millennials, um, is that 90% um, of millennials use that ubiquitous thing that I talked about earlier, the smartphone, to do some uh, uh, work with respect to their own finances, primarily getting information 80% of them uh, use a smartphone to initiate a transaction, probably a bill pay of some sort, back to my example of my own kids with Venmo, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately, the use of technology has not increased financial literacy. We found that those folks who said that they were using their smartphone either to get information or to initiate transactions, in that pool, 30% of them had at some point not managed to balance their checkbook or overdrawn their checking account. For those who hadn't used uh, new technologies, that number of individuals having overdrawn their account in the last year was only about 20%. Both numbers still high, uh, but showing, therefore, that the link between uh, financial technology and the smartphone and financial literacy is not as great as you'd like for it to be. So if you're still awake, I hope you're feeling really enthusiastic because I've just told you technology is changing in dramatic ways that we won't foresee. I've told you um, that demographics are creating some challenges globally, but also here in the US. And I've told you that a third big change is that we're all taking greater responsibility for our financial lives and we're not prepared to do it. So other than that, the world of change feels to me nothing to worry about. So now let me, having taken you down, the, the secret of a good speech, by the way, is to sort of bring the audience down and then save them. So this is gonna be the upper end of the curve where I'm gonna give you hope and optimism that you can overcome these three big challenges that I've just talked about. Uh, and you'll see some of these things that I'm gonna say um, will sound very much um, like something for millennials that your parents or grandparents would say. And for those of us who are parents or grandparents, this will sound like things that we do say. Um, and so, you know, there's gonna be a certain amount of common sense and I hope timeless information that I'm gonna try to convey here in a way that I hope brings us to life and makes it uh, very relevant to you. So my first piece of advice back on how do you deal with this is to do something that you're already doing, which should give you a lot of hope and confidence, right? And that is building on what we like to call, we economists, the dean and I and others in the audience, would call it your human capital. Uh, that's your skills, your knowledge, your experience. You know, all of those things that increase the value that you bring to an organization. Uh, importantly though, I wanna emphasize that it's not simply about building human capital while you're in school. It's thinking about your life experiences as opportunities to continue to, new, to renew your human capital. Um, so for those who are currently in school, what does that mean? It first means finishing your degree. Don't doubt that you'll do this. Do it with the right kind of commitment. Give it the focus that it deserves. For some of you who are already, you know, thinking about, uh, maybe some of you are pursuing advanced degrees, I would encourage more folks to think about doing that. Um, uh, one of the things my mother said to me when I was growing up is, stay in school for as long as you can. Um, I maybe overachieved because I stayed in school till I was 30. Um, um, but I would certainly say if you uh, can manage the finances of it, staying in school, getting that advanced degree is gonna be uh, very important. So obviously I emphatically disagree with some of the loose thought that's out there now that questions the value of higher education. You know, all of you know that a growing proportion of jobs, particularly jobs in the new economy, are gonna require uh, degrees and that trend is clearly only gonna continue as we become more technologically dependent. And for those, that 60% of the jobs that McKinsey identifies as having been touched or likely to be touched by technology, um, you know, the best way to be able to work in that world is to have the uh, human capital through the form of a degree. Um, 
the other point I'd make is the future is very, very unknown. So it's not just the specific technical knowledge and skills that you gain that are most important. In fact, many of those might become obsolete in this world of rapid change that I've talked about. I think what's really most important, and again, this is gonna sound like a cliche, but I think it's really important to bear down on it, is even for those of us such as you who are getting you know, first-rate technical education, not in engineering, STEM subjects, but also business training, et cetera, analytical skills, um, the most important skill, frankly, is that thing that we call uh, critical thinking skill. Uh, that strikes me as the most valuable attribute that you can take into the changing marketplace of the 21st century because the ability to think through a problem and to ask critical questions and to reach your own conclusions, I think is gonna be central to surviving this world of rapid change uh, that's important. I've already hinted at the next point I wanna make, so let me be very explicit. So getting that degree, two thumbs up, must get it done. But that's the beginning, not the end of education. It's more important than ever to commit to being what I call a lifelong learner meaning that you're never done with learning, no matter what your age or your stage in life uh, may be. Um, and so lifelong learning is really about having the mindset of curiosity. Uh, it's about engaging with your peers, reading widely, uh, taking advantage of opportunities to learn, both on and off the job. Importantly, in this time when we're looking at uh, deep segmentations and fissures in society, it's about uh, challenging yourself to hear clearly the other side of any one of these arguments, to get out of your comfort zone, uh, to learn from people who have very, very different points of view. Um, and so, you know, lifelong learning, I think, can also play a role in some of the challenges that we're confronting um, um, in society as well. The other reason uh, that I focus in initially on building human capital is in this world of change, the one thing that you can control, and you being a student, a faculty member, whatever it may be, is your ability to continue to learn and to re, re, replant yourself, if you will, uh, to continue down this path of being a lifelong learner. So a message that I'm trying to deliver at this point is in a world of constant change, in a world of threat, et cetera, one of the ways that human beings can best cope with that, at least I believe, and I'm not a psychologist, but you know, some years of experience have told me that you should control the things that you can control when there's so much out of your control. And so human capital uh, is one of those things that um, I would say uh, helped you uh, to learn how to be uh, in charge and control of your destiny. Um, let me now turn to the second lesson about how to deal in a world of uh, rapid change, and this is hopefully continuing to take you out of the valley of despair and take you up to the mountaintop of hope. Uh, and that second piece of advice is since we don't know exactly what lies ahead, be flexible in terms of how you're gonna to respond to what's going on. Um, students and even faculty, I think, have all heard, and certainly faculty and, and students have heard the analogy that your career is sort of like a career ladder. Uh, and I would encourage all of you, but certainly the younger folks in the audience, to put out of your mind the thought of being a career ladder. A ladder uh, implies that you start at the bottom, you work your way up in a very vertical, predictable, controlled manner till you get as far as you can uh, before it's time to move to retirement. Um, and I think that analogy is just completely wrong. Um, if you think of the world as creating a career ladder for you, or if you think of success as being driven by progressing up a predictable career ladder, then the changes that I've just talked about, you know, taking on more financial responsibility, demographic changes, certainly technology changes, will buffet you back and forth. I would encourage instead to have a different kind of analogy about your career, which is to think of your career as being a rock climbing wall. Uh, all of us have, have seen or hopefully done rock climbing to some degree. And I think that works much better in this ever evolving world because as you uh, proceed with your career in a rapidly changing world, what you're gonna find is that your path may occasionally be blocked as is true on a rock climbing wall. Reaching that next handhold may just be too far, um, as happens sometimes on a rock climbing wall, and you may find you have to take a step back, move laterally, maybe even move down a step um, in order to progress. And that strikes me as just a much better way to approach a career in a period of great you know, uncertainty. 
um, in, in an economic sense, I think, thinking about the world as a rock climbing wall as opposed to thinking about it as a career ladder is uh, sort of what we economists sometimes call a mini-max kind of strategy, minimizing, in some sense, the maximum risk or uncertainty that you're going to have to deal with by not getting yourself too aligned in a very vertical sense of how your career might, might unfold. Um, so what does this mean? It obviously means being flexible. Frankly, it means taking reasonable career risks, uh, taking opportunities that come, and obviously thinking about developing some new opportunities along the way. Um, I think that advice is good today. I think that's timeless advice. Uh, and frankly, you know, I stand before you as a person whose career has mirrored this rock climbing wall analogy as opposed to a career ladder. Um, you heard a little bit in the introduction, but in my uh, career, I've been a lawyer, a consultant, a public service. Uh, I've been the CEO of a major Fortune 100 company now uh, for 10 years. But getting to this place was never part of some master plan. Uh, when I was a student in college and law school and graduate school, it never dawned on me to try to build a career that would lead to being the CEO of a Fortune 100 company. Um, that was furthest from my mind. Um, what I did do, and the way I've ended up at this place, is very much around the points I've made already. One is continuous learning, and two, being ready to deal with risks, opportunities, and recognize that even, you know, maybe sometime that I had to take a step back in order to move forward. Uh, and so I really think it's encouraging, or I think it's important for me to encourage you not to be too rigid about your career paths and goals, being open to trying new things, unafraid to change course when necessary, and frankly, recognizing that the inevitable failures that are likely to occur in a world of rapid change are not permanent setbacks. And again, it's gonna sound like a cliche, but I believe to be true from my own experience. You know, success, one of my favorite quotes is success uh, is never final, failure is never fatal. And I think keeping that kind of mindset uh, as you move forward in a changing, rapidly evolving world is gonna be incredibly important to give you the kind of resilience to come back from an unexpectedly blocked path up that uh, rock climbing wall of a career that you're likely to have and frankly that I've had. My third and final piece of advice tonight or this afternoon goes to the third challenge that I talked about. And this would not surprise you as a person who has uh, now spent 10 years thinking about retirement security for five million Americans in the not-for-profit sectors. Uh, and that is to prepare for success in a world of constant change with the kinds of changes I've talked about. It is essential to build a strong foundation of financial knowledge. Uh, the demographic trends that I mentioned earlier are key to this discussion. Um, and as a leader of a retirement-oriented company, it would be remiss for me to not tell you that the demographics suggest that all of, all of you, certainly the younger folks in this room, are going to be uh, able to enjoy what one thinks of as retirement years, and I put air quotes around that for an obvious reason that I'll come back and talk about, that could be very long. So the current demographics show that for an, an individual male who reaches the age of 60 today has a, a high probability of living past the age of 85. Um, and for a 65-year-old woman, half of them will live to the age of 90. Uh, and so if one thought of retirement as at least uh, nominally starting at around the age of 65, doesn't actually happen that way for most people anymore, you could have two to three, maybe more decades of living in retirement. So that means that you're gonna be spending more years in retirement than anyone that you know, certainly than your grandparents did. Um, and that therefore means that you have to be prepared for that. So let me give you, being an economist, a few statistics on how unprepared American society is and why I close by talking about financial literacy. Uh, so the current estimates are that we might be short retirement savings somewhere between four and seven trillion dollars, uh, which is a huge number. Uh, and again, I emphasize the range because it's not 100% clear, but just anything that starts with trillion in terms of being short of savings tells you that we've got a, a serious challenge. The other challenge that we have in this space is well known, which is Social Security, which is the bedrock of retirement for many folks that you know, probably not many folks in the room, though it's an important contributor to everyone's retirement, is under strain and stress. Um, 
uh, all of you understand that the Social Security trustees has said that about uh, 2033, which is literally just around the corner um, in, in demographic time, uh, the Social Security Trust Fund will run out and therefore we'll only be able to uh, pay about 70 to 75 percent of the current commitments. Uh, and Congress has to take action long before we get to that 2033, 2034 year in order for things uh, uh, to occur. Um, so one of the things that one can do uh, around this question of preparing for uh, a longer retirement is to think about ensuring your retirement the way you ensure your life. Um, and there is a strong consensus among economists that driving towards what we call lifetime income solutions in the form of annuities, and here this is a, a blatant uh, uh, advertisement for TIA, um, is an important way uh, to help create a sense of stability as you get older um, and are uncertain where otherwise your, your retirement income might come from. For all the faculty and staff, I think you who are getting closer and closer to this, who work with us, you understand a bit of how uh, this works. For the younger individuals uh, in the organization, in the, in the audience, um, I want you to be a little bit like your former dean or your current dean was when he was first starting out, which is not necessarily fully thinking about retirement as being something around the corner, but at least start to think about how you're going to prepare for it and keep in mind uh, some of the activities that I've just sort of talked about. Um, the final point I'd make around finance is uh, there are, for the younger individuals, I think, some basic building blocks around financial literacy or financial performance. People often ask, well, can you make it seem more practical and real? So there are four or five things that I think we as a company have started to see as being central to uh, financial literacy for, for younger individuals uh, or financial well-being. One, obviously, is developing a plan. Um, and you know the sort of thinking through exactly what your goals and objectives are. Secondly, you can't do it yet, but when you get that first job, make sure you think wisely about saving. Um, uh, the obvious answer is you know your revenue, whatever it is, has got to be in excess of your expenses. Uh, the third, obviously, is thinking about uh, investing wisely, using basic rules of diversification, et cetera. Uh, the fourth major building block is thinking about using banking or the debt side of your balance sheet uh, wisely as well. And the fifth, which I've already talked about, is creating protection, uh, both short-term, long-term, and intermediate term. So those are four or five steps for young people in terms of you know, the financial uncertainties uh, that you're going to be confronting. So let me uh, close, and I hope I brought you back to you know, someplace close to optimism, um, by summarizing the points that I've made. Um, first, as the theme uh, of the speech suggests, we do live in a world of great change and disruption. Um, the, the three factors I pointed out, one is technology with the example of the iPhone, which didn't exist 10, 11, 12 years ago. Demographics, uh, which are inevitable. And then the associated economic forces uh, uh, that come with all of that. Um, many Americans uh, are silly quite concerned about the uncertainty and how they're going to uh, navigate that, and that is true if you're 25, 35, 65, 75, you still have uh, a period of time where this uh, rapid change creates uncertainty for you. And so what I've suggested is three ways to take control in a world of rapid change. First and foremost, build your human capital, uh, both today by finishing up those degrees for those who are in school, and then for the rest of us, Developing the habits of being a lifelong learner. Uh, it is never too, learn, or too late to learn new things. Uh, I disagree with the adage, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Being an old dog myself, I try to learn new tricks every day. Uh, the second thing, uh, um, and this again comes from personal experience, in a world of rapid change where things are unpredictable, then don't expect uh, a, a, uh, a, a climbing ladder or a, a career ladder expect more of a rock climbing wall. It is by having that kind of flexibility that you take advantage of unexpected opportunities, avoid unexpected risks, um, and frankly, I think, hopefully, minimize the maximum downside that you'll confront. And the third and most important point I made that ties back to what I do for a living, what many of us do for a living, is think about building up your own financial literacy so that you're not one of those folks who uh, in that pool that got only 44% of the answers right. 
So with that, let me stop, let me thank you for your attention, and let me open up for Q&A. So thank you very much. And I'm not quite sure, but I think we're gonna do Q&A, a couple of things have to happen. One is we need the house lights up, because I am staring into these really bright lights and can't see faces. Um, and then there are mics on the side, and so I'll let the folks with the mics on the side sort of point out anyone who has a hand up. I hope there are at least a few questions. And would you do me a favor, which is um, obviously introduce yourself, your link to Hofstra, and then uh, ask your question. Sure. Uh, my name is Jean Vizera, and I'm an alumni twice over, uh, ZARB uh, undergraduate and uh, MBA program. Good. And uh, I want to thank you for a very informative talk and uh, for lending the best of your experience to us tonight. Um, mm -hmm. First, do that. You know, you spoke um, very well to the uh, millennial generation and the considerations there. Do you have any advice for that sandwich generation, Generation X, caught between the millennial and the uh, boomer considerations? Uh, so I, I do, um, and first I'm sorry, uh, but... <laughs> No, let me, so uh, I say serious, sometimes you'll, you've now discovered I say serious things sort of in a funny way, but I think the, that middle generation is really a sandwich generation because you're dealing perhaps with your own boomer child or soon to be, and you may be dealing with an aging parent, and you're thinking about how you're gonna save and prepare for your own future. Um, and that's, that's a tough place to be. So uh, all of the things I've just said I think still apply continuous learning because you are going to be in a place where you're going to have to, you know, not you personally, but a, but a person in that middle generation could easily be in a place where job disruptions of the type that I've just talked about could still occur. Uh, and you, you know, one has to be prepared for that. So I'd say all those same things still occur. Um, I think in the financial space of the building blocks I just talked about, most of the folks I know who are in the middle generation are also in a barbell in terms of how they are thinking about their own finances. Either they are still in a, a mode of being, you know, almost dollar stretchers where the, the pressure of, you know, kids, aging parents, mortgage not quite paid off, trying to save for retirement, makes it feel very, very, very difficult to make it all meet. Or they are the lucky group that started saving at a young age and are feeling as though they're gonna, you know, gracefully move into retirement. If you're in that first group, the advice I always give is, frankly, to set priorities. There will be things that you cannot do, well not, that one could not do. I would always prioritize, uh, frankly, preparing for retirement, because that is going to be inevitable. Um, and you know, it, it may feel a little selfish, um, but we know it's gonna occur. We know that somebody who's, let's say, um, mid to fi late 50s now still has 30 to 40 years of life expectancy ahead of him or her. Uh, and so I always put more emphasis on retirement and what that might mean, frankly, is a little less support for you know, that, that child who's just getting started or making some tough trade-offs about you know, trying to deal with the, with the parent. I would also always tell someone who is in that space to think very much about paying off those big debts. If you still have a mortgage left or something of that sort, I'd say focus in on paying that off. It's the same sort of advice you'd give a younger person about their debts but it becomes, I think, even more urgent to build equity in a home um, if you are you know, in that sandwich generation. So those are just a couple of the thoughts, but I think at the end of the day, the main message is, as my parents used to say to me every once in a while, you have to pay yourself first. Um, and so I would create some prioritizations about making sure that your financial life is secure before thinking about all those other responsibilities that one might have. Are there any more questions? Hope there are a few more. Here's a hand right here on the aisle. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Why don't you stand up, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Subir. I'm a junior at Hofstra. Good for I, you. Um, I'm currently working in the Student Managed Investment Fund with a couple Ooh. of my colleagues here. Okay, uh, what's, so your, what's your return look like? Uh, we're, we're, we're up 20%, so we're, we're doing pretty, pretty well for ourselves. Um, hmm. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, so thank you for sharing your insight with us on your experience through your career and your life. Um, I just wanted to touch upon a point you were you brought up briefly earlier about the NFP reports. Um, I know recently they've been sort of volatile, um, last month being relatively okay. And um, I was just curious to see with the rise of interest rates, um, in addition to that with the uh, slow, well, more so rapid integration of technology and jobs, how do you see those numbers changing over the near term? And with the gradual rise of interest rates, how do you see the overall economy um, coming down to a state of normalization? Okay, so let me start this. First, let me congratulate you on good investment performance. Did you, you and your team focus in on one or two stocks? Is it a broadly diversified portfolio? Hmm. Can I get your card? <laughs> so to answer the question, um, I think with respect to the rise of interest rates in the overall economy, I think what, uh, and I assume you're talking about the Fed, and the federal funds rate more, more broadly, okay. So I think what the Fed is attempting to do, and I, I give them pretty good odds of doing this, is to move interest rates up really gradually so as to not choke off this very, very long-lived recovery, but make it more sustainable. And uh, what I mean by that is I think the biggest risk that one can see to uh, the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th year of recovery has to do with inflation picking up unexpectedly and then the Fed really having to raise rates rapidly, you know, cutting asset prices, you know, damaging your portfolio and mine, uh, and, and, you know, slowing things down that way. And so the, you emphasize a couple times the gradual rates, the gradual increase in the Fed funds rate, and I think that is in some sense, if that happens, then I think we have a, a reasonably good shot of prolonging this, um, uh, this expansion um, because you know, there are many other parts about the economy that are actually looking very, very good. Uh, going back to um, your, the first part of the question, I in some sense give exactly the same answer, which is the essence of what the Fed's trying to do is to move rates up so gradually that it only you know, makes sure that the economy is on, and all of the subcomponents, the unemployment rate, the, et cetera, all of that is on the same uh, trajectory of continuing to move uh, pretty much in the same direction. The challenge that they are obviously are confronting uh, is twofold. One is we really are in terra incognita when it comes to unemployment rates this low without having inflation pick up uh, dramatically. Uh, and so, you know, the, the old benchmarks don't help uh, very much. And secondly, they're also trying to do this at a time when we have um, uh, what is a historically unusual amount of fiscal stimulus running through the economy, uh, which might create some risks to the upside when it comes to inflation. And they're doing it in a time where, you know, some other geopolitical forces might create some uh, other uncertainties on the other side. So I think their biggest challenge is not their strategy or their goal, it's the ability to do it in a world that's also for them quite uncertain around a number of other macro factors. Uh, and frankly, you know, probably outs definitely outside of the living memory of almost anyone who's making policy. Is that, is that responsive to your question? It's, oh, perfect. <laughs> I want you to keep asking questions and then, you know, the same feedback to the answers, so. <laughs> whatever the answer may be. <laughs> Sir. Hi, Dr. Ferguson. My name is Richard Fraser, and I'm a graduate of the Hofstra Business School before it was the Czar Business School. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I fully agree with you about the human capital development. However, what bugs me, what I see, is when you talk about critical thinking, these devices, cell phones, have limited critical thinking. I find many of younger generations stop thinking because they can just use their phone to find an answer. How do we improve on that? So that's uh, one I am not going to... Um, um, uh, broadly denigrate entire generations of people. So <laughs> some of our younger folks may want to take exception with, with this. Having said that, let me, let me get back to a place where I do think I agree with you, which is you know, newer technologies have allowed us and institutions around us to target us with information they know will create a reaction 
because it is information that sort of validates what we initially believed. It's information that's similar to information we searched for before. Um, you know, it, it, is, it creates these social networks that are actually more insulated than isolated. So I, 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 I think you and I are fundamentally agreeing that it's not so much that you can find anything that you want through a Google search, and I have to be totally trained. I'm on the board of Alphabet slash Google, so you'll hear me talk about Google as this great thing, because I actually believe that it is. Um, but the flip side, not for Google, but for many others, is I think what we're finding is we are, um, because they have so much information about us, it is now easier to make us into small sub-segments of like-minded individuals. And if you think about you know, what some of the concerns are around Facebook and other places, it's a little bit of just that. And if you think about the big concerns that emerged around the election, ex, you know, whatever it may have happened with foreign powers, um, there's just a huge amount of concern that we all are living in these bubbles. And the same thing is true with the proliferation of TV channels um, and you know, uh, uh, radio, et cetera. All of it does, I think, lean in the direction that you are focused on, um, which is a sense of putting us into these echo chambers of reinforcing our own biases um, and it's sad. Now, you know, economists have known for a long time that there's a tendency to overvalue information that reinforces what we originally have thought and to undervalue information that's challenging to our original thinking. And unfortunately, we live in a world where almost that's almost the only thing that happens. I, I don't have an obvious answer on how to push against it, uh, except to quite explicitly push against it. Um, so for those of you who would naturally turn on um, MSNBC, for example, I would encourage you to turn on Fox for you know, a few hours just to you know, hear and see what's going on. You, you may or may not agree with it, um, and in fact it may rile you up somewhat, but at least to, uh, to be aware of it. Um, and so you know, I think you know, I don't have the obvious answer. I'm reinforcing your question, but I think if you are going to be in the world of being a continuous learner, then the curiosity factor about what is the other side thinking, why they say what they're saying, might be one of the paths out of, out of the kind of dilemma that we're now confronting, uh, of being basically segments of one uh, being reinforced by you know, all the new technology that's out there. Okay, it's more to, sort of philosophical, but hopefully close to the answer. This is an academic question, not uh, a personal question. Focusing for a moment on social security, would the answer to the upcoming social security crisis be just uh, raising the retirement age? Oh. And so uh, given how much longer people are living, what we have now is a retirement age of 62 as a, a starting point, really doesn't make sense anymore. And should we just revise that? Wouldn't that solve what we're dealing with? So the, the answer is um, yes. I mean, you and I and you know any I often say that when I'm the company of retirement economists, the answer to the Social Security problem can be written on this, the back of a three by five card. And it has th three components. One is to raise the retirement age. The other is to change the indexing a bit without getting too technical, but there are, you know, there are ways to index it so that the inflation indexing is not so rapid. And the third, obviously, is to do more means testing so that you know, folks who are well off are drawing less than folks who aren't so well off. The challenge, all, so it's easy to write that down on a three by five card. Every time I say that, I get a lot of pushback, not from this audience, but from other audiences, particularly around item one. Um, because, and I said this once to a, a labor union leader, um, and he said, you know, that is a death penalty for all of my members who are doing blue collar or pink collar work. And so, you know, we, we just have to be mindful that it's easy for you and me to say, oh, you know, start the initial draw at Social Security at the age of 70 and then full draw at 75 or whatever it may be. For big parts of the American population, um, that is not workable. And so, you know, I think the, the challenge is to figure out how we manage to do both of those things simultaneously. Take advantage of longevity by having those of us who can work longer work longer, i.e., you know, full Social Security later, while also recognizing that there are a bunch of folks for whom that is really not an option. But it's, no, there's no doubt that that's sort of part of the, part of the solution. It's just how you make it real. Are there any more? I hope there are a few more questions. Hi. Hi. My name is Janet Lenningham. I am a Zarb alum. 
I'm a professor in the management department, and I'm currently vice dean in the school as well. Oh, good. Um, so I'm very connected to Hofstra. And I want to echo everyone in saying thank you so much for being with us today. This has been wonderful. And my question actually kind of stemmed from your discussion. I, too, have uh, children who only know how to do Venmo, never have even, I don't think, looked at checkbooks, didn't even learn about that, honestly, in their, in their undergrad, you know, in their, in their grammar yeah. school uh, curriculum. My question is about data security. And I'm sure that's a big issue that you are constantly focused in on and talking about. And so I'm just curious if you can speak to some of the things that the challenges that you see for companies such as yours collecting all the data points that you have. And what do you expect cybersecurity to look like going forward? So look, I mean, first, let me start without jinxing it and knocking on plexiglass here to say that we have not, and, and our company had to confront you know, massive data breaches of the type that you read about with, with you know, Target and other companies. Having said that, when I talk to my um, chief information security officer and listen to others, we have to be, all of us, have to, have to recognize that there is uh, an invisible war that's going on around us all the time <laughs> where, you know, the, those who want data are, are constantly trying to penetrate, and obviously those who are protecting us are working really hard to stop that. What I've learned from my chief information security officer is two or three things. One is it's really important to be part of a network that shares information quickly. Um, and again, knocking on plexiglass up here, there have been times when, um, I know of one case in particular, when a financial services firm announced a breach we managed to put our patch in literally, literally within an hour or so before we saw people trying to penetrate. So one way to do this, I'm learning, is to be part of a network that shares information fully and honestly on the defensive side of it. Secondly, is to spend an awful lot of time um, uh, training all of us individuals on how to manage data. Uh, and so you know, one of the things that we do, and I hope you do as well, is we have these uh, phishing expeditions in our company and you know you if you click on the wrong button or you click on an email that you should have known as phishing you get a rather surprising relatively ugly picture of my chief information security officer pointing his finger at you and telling you that you have to go and and take some training so i guess the second point is we all have to recognize that we are now part of the problem um, you know the way we handle our own data creates part of the vulnerability the third thing is back to a point I made about AI. Um, you know, the ability of artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, to observe patterns and patterns that are different um, is really gonna be an important part of managing data, data privacy, data security. Um, and the final point I wanna make is we also have to recognize when it comes to personal data and a variety of other things that it's, some of it's just not secure. I mean, there's this. We, we all want to have you know, the sense that we can do whatever searches we want and then it's all going to sort of disappear someplace. We've got to be really smart users of these technologies and recognize that whatever you do, you know, good companies, bad companies, whatever that may be, that data still exists somewhere. And just be you know, savvier users and savvier consumers and, and just be mindful. And I guess the final point I'd make, and here, here I must say there's a difference between me and my millennial children, um, I think our expectations about what data privacy means seem to have evolved pretty dramatically. Um, now, I happen to know that for a variety of reasons, a lot of my personal information is out there in the dark web, and you know, there's frankly not much you can do about it, except then to be a savvier you know, consumer of what you are doing, so looking at your credit card bills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you have to also take a little bit of accountability yourself. None of those things is the perfect answer. It's a big challenge, and you know, it's the flip side of being so interconnected in real time with huge you know, data centers around keeping track of everything. Generally speaking, not using it for nefarious purposes, but you know, we are gonna just have to you know, sort of raise our level of awareness um, while also, frankly, managing our expectations and what's gonna happen to us, to the data. Um, that's not a perfectly satisfactory answer. That is sort of the way I think about it as a CEO of a company and also as a consumer uh, and a person who just found out two days ago, I'm sorry, last Friday, that one of my credit cards had been breached. So, you know, I got, I got my new one today and, you know, life goes on. 
Sure. Please join me in thanking Roger Ferguson. Oh, for thank you all very much. Thanks a lot.